Please be seated. Ladies and gentlemen of the Joint Assembly and honored guests, I am proud to present to you the Honorable Henry Dargan McMaster, the governor of the great state of South Carolina. Governor. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Okay. All right, y'all be seated, please. Y'all, I'm a little hoarse. I hope my voice holds out. Mr. Speaker, Mr. President, ladies and gentlemen of the General Assembly, my fellow South Carolinians, we are here tonight to address challenges and opportunities. But first, as in prior years, I'd like to recognize in those in uniform whom we lost in the line of duty in 2022. Officer Roy Andrew Barr of the Casey Police Department, Deputy Austin Derek Aldridge of the Spartanburg County Sheriff's Office, Corporal Sarah K. Weaver of Florence County Emergency Medical Services, and Master Police Officer Terrell Owens Riley of the Columbia Police Department. To the families and loved ones of these brave South Carolinians, with all our hearts, we offer our condolences. We are eternally grateful for your service. I'm delighted to have with us once again tonight our First Lady, my bride Peggy, whose son Henry Jr. and son Henry Jr., whose wife Virginia is at home with their four-month-old daughter, Margot Gray. Also, our daughter Mary Rogers, whose husband Sam is home with their seven-month-old son, James Dargan. Will y'all please stand and let's say hello to you. Thank you. And our Lieutenant Governor Pamela Evett and her husband David are here tonight. Please stand and be recognized. Our state constitutional officers are here with us too tonight, including our new Superintendent of Education, Ellen Weaver. Will you please all stand and be recognized? Finally, will the members of the best cabinet in the nation please stand and be recognized? Thank you. The people of the great state of South Carolina have given me the honor and privilege of serving as your governor for another four years. My family and I thank you. My pledge to all is that we will not squander this opportunity. We will continue to act boldly, think big, and continue building on our successes. South Carolina is richly blessed with a hardworking and talented people. Our quality of life and cultural heritage, abundant natural resources, and prosperous economy make us unique and attractive to all. In fact, South Carolina is the third fastest growing state in the nation, according to the U.S. Census Bureau. People want to be here. Our booming economy has once again created a record budget surplus, this year totaling over $3.5 billion in unexpected revenue. State government is in superior fiscal shape. Today we have the largest rainy day reserve fund balance and lowest amount of debt than at any other time in recent memory. So, it should come as no surprise that 2022 was the most successful year for economic growth in our state's history, with the record for the largest capital investment project broken twice in the same year. In 2022, we announced 120 projects that will create 
over 14,000 new jobs with $10.27 billion, $10.27 billion in new capital investment. That's almost two and a half times as much as 2021 and more than ever before. As another sign of our economic strength, last year we almost quadrupled our foreign direct investment from the previous year. <clears throat> Excuse me, every day employers are creating new jobs, entrepreneurs are opening new businesses and companies are deciding to locate in South Carolina. The Palmetto State has one of the nation's fastest growing container ports, two innovative inland ports, 33 airports, 2,300 miles of rail lines, and more than 41,000 miles of state-maintained highways. The Port of Charleston has the deepest harbor, 52 feet on the East Coast, and its volume will grow exponentially this year. There are 208 million people, two-thirds of the U.S. population within two days' drive of South Carolina. Our thriving tourism industry continues to break records. Compared to pre-pandemic levels in 2019, in the 2022 fiscal year, accommodations tax collections were up almost 50 percent. Our state park system revenues were up 46 percent, and admissions tax collections were up 28 percent. Not only did we drive our way through a deep debilitating pandemic with our decisions based on common sense in the Constitution, but we thrived. Tonight, we will recognize several of the businesses which announced new investments in South Carolina during the record-breaking year of 2022. As you will notice, the automob automotive industry continues moving towards electric vehicles, and South Carolina is moving along with it. Last year, I issued an executive order prioritizing the recruitment of these manufacturers to ensure that our state will continue to be seen as an ideal place for manufacturers and their suppliers to do business. South Carolina will continue to adapt as industry innovates and grows. In Berkeley County, Redwood Materials will invest three and a half billion dollars, the largest announcement in the history of South Carolina, and create 1,500 jobs for a new battery materials recycling facility. In the upstate, BMW will invest $1.7 billion, the second largest investment in state history, $1 billion of which will prepare plant Spartanburg to produce electric vehicles, and $700 million to build a new high-voltage battery assembly facility in Woodruff, which will create, three, create 300 more jobs. <clears throat> Excuse me. Envision AESC will invest $810 million in Florence to build a new state-of-the-art battery cell gigafactory and employ over 1,000 residents to supply technology-leading battery cells to power the next generation of electric vehicles. In Colleton County, Control Matic Pomega will build a three gigawatt hour capacity lithium ion battery factory that will produce grill stage scale energy storage. The company's $279 million investment will create approximately 575 new jobs. Bosch made two announcements in 22 that continue to develop the company's nearly 50, 50 year history in the state of South Carolina. In Anderson County, Bosch plans to invest $200 million and create up to 350 new jobs to expand operations to become the company's first production operation of fuel cell technology in the United States. And in Dorchester County, Bosch launched the production of electric motors to support the U.S. market demand for electrified vehicles with plans for future growth. Bosch plans Bosch plans to invest $200 million and create up to 350 new jobs to expand operations to become the first, the country's first production operation of fuel technology in the United States, as I said. Bosch plans to invest $260 million and create 350 jobs in North Charleston with a combined investment of $625 million and 50 new jobs, Nucor Steel is expanding Berkeley County 
to include a new galvanizing line to meet the increased demand for steel and air separation unit to modernize the mill. A.E. Sween, a leading supplier in the ready-to-eat sandwich industry, will invest $38 million and create 300 new jobs in Greenwood County. In Greenville County, Health Supply of the U.S. is investing $150 million in creating 600 new jobs for a new manufacturing facility that will produce American-made personnel protective equipment. Keon of North America will invest $400 million and create 450 jobs to reshore the manufacturing of core components for industrial lift trucks from China to Somerville. When I call your names, will the leaders from these companies here with us tonight please stand and be recognized? And ladies and gentlemen, if we please hold our applause until they're all standing. <clears throat> Excuse me. Mr. Jason Thompson, the Chief Financial Officer of Redwood Materials. Ms. Sherry McCraw, the Vice President of Human Resources of BMW. Mr. Jeff Deaton, the Managing Director for North America of Envision AESC. Mr. Bahadir Vetki, the Chief Executive Officer of Control Magnet Pomega. Mr. Mike Sweaty, the President of Bosch North America. Mr. Nathan Prane Gear, the Vice President and General Manager of Nucor Steel. Ms. Christy Broadwater, the Senior Vice President of Human Resources for EA Swing. Mr. Chris Garcia, the Chief Executive Officer of Health Supply U.S. Mr. Jonathan Dawley, the President and Chief Executive Office, Officer of Keon, North America. And finally, our Secretary of Commerce, Harry Leitze, and his remarkable team, which worked around the clock to produce these successes, and they are here tonight. Ladies and gentlemen, we thank you all for making 2022 a record-breaking year in South Carolina, and this year, let's do it again. Thank you. Last year presented numerous challenges for the people of South Carolina, including those resulting from the misguided and unconstitutional policies of the Biden administration, such as dramatic inflation and sharp interest rate hikes. Left unchecked, runaway federal spending has created the specter of a recession on our horizon. Yet, I am confident about the future of our state because I have faith in the people and in those they elected to represent them in this General Assembly. And I'm excited to renew our successful partnership, one based on working together through collaboration, communication, and cooperation. Today, we are presented with an opportunity to take bold, transformative actions that will build prosperity for generations to come. The foundations of our successes rest on three pillars economic strength, education, and our natural environment. This past November, South Carolinians overwhelmingly approved a constitutional amendment increasing the minimum required balance in the Rainy Day Reserve Fund. It was increased from 5% to 7% of the total amount of General Appropriations Act funds available to be appropriated in any year. I now ask the General Assembly to set aside an additional $500 million to voluntarily increase the Rainy Day Reserve Fund minimum balance from 7% to 10%. By saving this money instead of spending it, we can once again be prepared for any future economic uncertainties should they arise. Until recently, South Carolina had the highest personal income tax rate in the Southeast and the 12th highest in the nation. Last year, we worked together to pass the largest income tax cut in state history. I thank you for that. This made South Carolina even more competitive with other states for new jobs and capital investment. A tax cut has the impact of a pay raise, letting people keep and spend more of their hard-earned money, 
which itself is a catalyst for even more economic growth and prosperity. In February, the State Board of Economic Advisors is scheduled to issue an updated revenue forecast. Should an increase in future revenues allow, I ask the General Assembly to use additional funds to speed up the income tax cut schedule so taxpayers can keep even more of their hard-earned money. In addition, I recommend setting aside a significant amount of funds to reinvest in our state's record-breaking economic growth uh, development efforts rather than borrowing it through the issuance of bonds, which increases our state's debt. A one-time appropriation of $500 million will allow the Department of Commerce to satisfy all outstanding obligations and incentives without borrowing money. The House recently approved this appropriation, and it is my hope that the Senate will follow suit. An additional one-time appropriation of $200 million will allow the apartment to identify and secure properties for future megasite development. Rural South Carolina is beautiful. Rural South Carolina has everything it needs for beauty, peace, and tranquility. But what it needs for good public and economic health is water and sewer. The right water and sewer systems in a county can transform a tax base. That means jobs, good schools, strong families, and a safe and vibrant community. In 2022, the State Rural Infrastructure Authority received $800 million in American Rescue Plan Act funds, ARPA. Their purpose, replace, repair, and consolidate our state's aging and outdated rural water, sewer, and stormwater infrastructure through competitive grants. The demand exceeded the supply, and RIA received grant applications in 2022 for almost $2 billion, greatly excess. This year, I am recommending that a minimum of $380 million in remaining ARPA funds be used to continue making these transformative water and sewer grants in our rural communities. There is no infrastructure more in need of big, bold, and continued investment than our state's roads, bridges, highways, and interstates. Our successes are outrunning our infrastructure. Last year, the Department of Transportation got almost $1 billion to accelerate and jumpstart construction, expansion, and improvements to our state-owned roads, bridges, highways, and to widen our interstates. However, in the immortal words of Jerry Reed, we got a long way to go and a short time to get there. So we got to invest more and we got to move now. This year, my executive budget provides an additional $850 million to continue speeding up the completion of projects which will relieve traffic congestion on interstates and highways, repair or repave local roads, and fix over 400 bridges across our state. Education. Working together, we've taken bold steps to improve the education of our children that they receive in the classroom. Until last year, South Carolina's system for funding 12, excuse me, K-12 education was archaic and confusing, a piecemeal system consisting of 29 line item appropriations. Now a consolidated formula makes sure that the funding follows the child. It keeps pace with student enrollments and provides financial resources to support a state average student-teacher ratio of 11.2 students per teacher, with an average teacher salary, including fringe benefits, of $72,991. My executive budget also increases state age aid to classrooms by $254 million. To increase the percentage of children who enter our public schools ready to learn, we unleashed the free market and expanded full-day four-year-old kindergarten to all at-risk children in the state. Parents may now choose the public, private, or for-profit child care provider that best suits the child's educational needs. Today, we are serving 16,103 at-risk children in that program, which is an all-time high. Last year, we were at 18 children eligible to participate in the state-funded full-day 4K kindergarten at St. Martin de Poor's School located here in Columbia. St. Martin is a private school participating in the full-day 4K 
program. This year, parents of nine of those children from the previous year wanted to enroll their children in five-year-old kindergarten at the school, but they could not afford to pay the tuition. Thanks to the generosity of the Catholic Church, they were able to continue their education at St. Martin at no cost to the families. Jonathan McMillan is one of those children. He participated in the full four-day program last year and is now enrolled in the five-year kindergarten at St. Martin. According to his mothers and teachers, his mother and teachers, Jonathan has been saved from future struggle and challenge by staying at St. Martin. Quote, he had challenges upon his arrival. He had different social skills that required the intentionality of our educational team. Jonathan is not shy. He is brilliant and a determined leader, end of quote. His teacher, Ms. Hare, says that her goal is to help him find his light so he can brightly shine to the world around him. Jonathan is here tonight accompanied by his mother, Ms. Jenna Boo, along with the principal of St. Martin, Ms. Dolores Gilliard. Ms. Gilliard has served as principal for five years. She completed a 40-year career at public schools in Richland One District, Richland One School District, spending 22 years as a principal before coming to St. Martin. Jonathan and ladies, will you please stand and be recognized? Thank you. My executive budget also provides $25 million in lottery dollars for the creation of education scholarship accounts, also called ESAs, pending a change in the law by the General Assembly. These funds will allow lower income parents to choose the type of education environment and instruction that best suits their child's unique needs. Teacher pay. My executive budget also proposes to continue the remarkable progress we have made in raising teacher pay, and we must do more. New teaching positions are being created every year at new schools constructed to keep up with our growing population. Six years ago, the minimum starting salary of our teachers was $30,113, and the average teacher salary was below the southeastern average. Today. The minimum starting salary of our teachers is $40,000, and the average teacher salary now exceeds the southeastern average. That is progress. My executive budget proposes increasing teacher salaries by $2,500 at every step in the state salary schedule, making the new minimum starting teacher salary $42,500. My goal by 2026 is a minimum starting salary of at least, at least $500, In addition, my executive budget provides every eligible public school teacher for the upcoming school year with a one-time $2,500 retention supplement, half in December, the other half in May. Ms. McKenna Blankenship is a first year teacher at Bay Road Elementary School in Darlington County School District. She teaches the first grade. Ms. Blankenship was a teaching fellow at Francis Marion University where she completed her bachelor's degree. She is the daughter of Ms. Jennifer Blankenship, also a teacher in the Darlington County School District. She teaches English and the teacher cadet program at the Mays High School for Math, Science, and Technology. The teacher cadet program is a high school course which encourages academically talented high school students to consider teaching as a career. McKenna always wanted to be a teacher. As she said, quote, my mom was a lot of inspiration for my journey. I enjoy seeing students make connections with their life and what they are learning in school, but also the aha moment when they truly understand a concept. My first year is going awesome, and I could not have been more blessed with the community I chose. These students are bright and always begin the day with a surprise. 
I learn more as a teacher and a person every day. This career and opportunity with the students fulfills my life in more than one way, end of quote. McKenna and her mama are here with us tonight. Ladies, will you please stand and be recognized? Placing an armed certified school resource officer known as an SRO in every school in every county all day every day has been one of my top priorities. At my request, the General Assembly began funding a grant program administrated by the Department of Public Safety, Public Safety, DPS, to provide school districts with funds to hire more resource officers for our 1,283 schools. The grant program has been very successful and has more than doubled the number of officers assigned to a school, going from 406 to 982 in just four years. This year, I'm recommending an additional $27.3 million to provide an additional 188 schools with a school resource officer. With this appropriation, 90% of South Carolina's public schools will have a school resource officer assigned to their campus. In July of 2021, Michael Tucker was named program manager for the SRR program at the Department of Public Safety. During Mr. Tucker's first year working with school districts and local law enforcement agencies, the number of state-funded school resource officers increased by 74%. For his exemplary work to improve school safety in our state, Mr. Tucker was recognized in October as the DPS Public Servant of the Year. Join Michael, joining Michael tonight is the Director of the Department of Public Safety, Rob Woods, and Chief of Staff, Michael Oliver. Gentlemen, please stand and be recognized. Thank you. To train our state's School resource officers, I recommend providing the State Law Enforcement Division with a three and a half million dollars to create the Center for School Safety and Targeted Violence. Located at the old Gilbert Elementary School, this partnership with the Lexington School District 1 will provide a state-of-the-art training center in a real-life setting for law enforcement officers and school personnel. Last year, we expanded the investigative jurisdiction of the State Inspector General to reflect concerns that South Carolina unions have regarding the management of our public schools, especially the management of taxpayer funds by public school boards. It was a good first step towards restoring the public's confidence in the action of school boards. We should expand this transparency. To this end, the public should also know who's getting paid to influence decisions made by county, municipal, or school board officials. These lobbyists should be required to register with the State Ethics Commission, just like those who are paid to lobby the legislature. What's good for the State House is good for the School House. Members of the General Assembly, send me this legislation and I will sign it into law. We know that access to an affordable degree or skilled trade certificate is essential to ensure that our state has the trained and educated workforce to compete for jobs and investment in the future. Manufacturers in particular view the availability of skilled labor and as critical to their decisions to invest here. To address the critical labor shortage affecting key sectors of our economy, I'm asking the General Assembly to invest an additional $78 million in lottery funds to expand workforce scholarships for the future through the South Carolina Technical College system. In the last two years, this highly successful program has empowered over 10,000 South Carolinians to earn an industry credential in high demand careers like manufacturing, healthcare, computer science, information technology, transportation, logistics, and construction. Gina Rocanella, 
a graduate of Airport High School in Lexington School District 2, is pursuing an associate degree in early childhood and elementary education from Midlands Technical College. In the afternoons, she works in an after-school program caring for preschool and elementary age students. After-school programs provide activities for students and allow mothers and fathers to work. After completing her associate degree, Ms. Rocanella plans to transfer to a four-year college to complete her teacher certification requirements and become a teacher. She received a workforce scholarship to attend Midlands Technical College because all regions of our state face a critical shortage of childcare workers. According to the U.S. Census Bureau labor statistics, there are 100,000 fewer childcare workers today in America than before the pandemic. They are in high demand. Ms. Rocanella is joining us tonight, and with her is Dr. Ron Rames, president of Midlands Technical College. And this would not have been possible without the tremendous leadership of Dr. Tim Hardy, president of the State Technical College System, who is also here tonight. Will you all please stand and be recognized? All y'all. My executive budget marks the fourth consecutive year that I've asked the General Assembly to freeze college tuition for in-state students with an appropriation to our institutions of higher education of $43 million. This represents the 5.2% increase in higher education price index for 2022 and is based on the number of in-state students enrolled at each public institution. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Taylor. We are, we are also providing a, school, a record amount of financial aid and scholarship for students in need. I propose providing $80 million so that every South Carolinian who qualifies for federal need-based financial aid as measured by the federal Pell Grants receives sufficient state financial assistance to attend any in-state public college, university, or technical college. And students at private, independent, and historically black colleges and universities will receive an additional $20 million for tuition grants and assistance. In just two years, the University of South Carolina has almost doubled the number of in-state students receiving need-based grants from 2,000 students to more than 3,900 from every county in our state. With us tonight is Jasmine Laura Guerrero, a junior at the University of South Carolina, majoring in political science. Upon graduating, she plans to pursue a PhD in political science. For the past three years, she has received a need-based grant. Ms. Guerrero is a first-generation college student. She is an Opportunity Scholar, a Ronald Lee McNair Scholar, and a Magell Magellan Scholar. She is part of the Gamecock Guarantee Program, which provides financial and academic support to first-generation college students. And she will graduate having no student loan debt. Before entering USC, Ms. Guerrero attended the Academy for the Arts, Science, and Technology, a public magnet high school in Myrtle Beach. Jasmine, please stand and be recognized. Ladies and gentlemen, we must continue to address the repairs needed at the aging state-owned buildings and infrastructure on the campuses of our four-year colleges, technical colleges and universities. I ask the General Assembly to join me in paying down the state's deferred maintenance liability with $209 million million in capital reserve funds to be distributed pro rata based on each institution's in-state enrollment. Let's pay for this right now rather than borrowing it and creating more debt. In addition, I ask that the General Assembly complete the funding of the Battelle Alliance, a collaborative nuclear sciences research partnership between the University of South Carolina, Clemson University, South Carolina State University, and the Savannah River National Laboratory. 
with an appropriation of $100 million in addition to the $20 million appropriated last year. This alliance will develop workforce training programs designed to develop a pipeline of new talent to fill engineering, science, research, and management positions for private industry and nuclear facilities, including those operated by the Department of Energy. The impact on our research campuses will be far-reaching and dramatic. Healthcare. It's clear that the mental health crisis exists in South Carolina following the COVID-19 pandemic, especially among our young people. Many are still struggling with the effects of disruptions, virtual instruction, isolation, and constant changes to normal routines. South Carolinians in crisis must have access to professional mental health counseling and services. To meet the growing demand for these services, I'm recommending an allocation of nearly $45 million to the Department of Mental Health. These funds will support the agency's ability to recruit and retain mental health professionals, provide inpatient services, increase access to crisis services, such as suicide prevention hotlines, including one specifically for veterans and community-based treatment services. Last year, I directed Health and Human Services Director Robbie Kerr to initiate an immediate review of our state's behavioral health funding and delivery system. It became clear from Director Kerr's efforts that the time has come to modernize and restructure South Carolina's siloed health care delivery, delivery agencies and the Department of Mental Health, the Department of Health and Human Services, and the Department of Health and Environmental Control, among others. My executive budget includes a $5 million appropriation to the Department of Administration for the purpose of procuring the professional expertise necessary to analyze and, pro and provide the General Assembly by June 30, 2024 with a comprehensive plan to re restructure these agencies, consolidating and privatizing wherever possible. Our booming economy sometimes puts our state agencies as a disadvantage with the private sector in recruiting and retaining good employees. My executive budget provides $78 million for recruitment and retention salary increases for state employees, $2 million for one-time $2,500 sign-on bonus for first-time state government hires, <clears throat> and $2 million to the Department of Administration so they can assist smaller state agencies with marketing and advertising efforts to fill those hard-to-hire positions. I'm also recommending that there be no increase in the employee paid premiums for state health plan participants and that we add at no cost to state employees an annual OBGYN exam for all females similar to the existing no cost adult wellness visit which was added two years ago. Finally, the South Carolina retirement system, all, often called the state pension plan, has one of the largest unfunded liabilities in the nation at nearly $24 million. The system only has assets equal to 64% of what is required to pay beneficiaries, which places our pension system fifth worth in the nation. Once again, I ask that the state pension plan be closed to new beneficiaries as of December 31, 2023, and that new employees be prospectively enrolled in the state optional retirement program, which is a defined contribution 401k plan. Another year of inaction is another year in which the unfunded liability will be in the pension plan will, will increase. What this means is we cannot kick this can down the road any further. Public safety. Keep South Carolinians safe, we must maintain a robust law enforcement presence and properly fund the police. Our state law enforcement agencies continue to lose valuable and experienced people because they're unable to remain competitive with pay and benefits of other agencies and private sector. Thanks to the compensation review conducted by Marcia Adams, Director of the Department of Administration, our state law enforcement and criminal justice agencies have begun to stem the tide of personnel loss with a $40 million 
in recruitment and retention pay raises provided in last year's General Appropriations Act. I am proposing that we continue to build on this momentum by providing an additional $21.5 million for recruitment and retention pay raises this year with the understanding that we will continue doing it. I'm also proposing a $2,000 state income tax credit for every active duty law enforcement officer, firefighter, first responder, and emergency medical technician. This non-refundable tax credit will provide a total of $38.4 million in income tax relief for those who put their lives on the line each day to protect and serve our people. <laughs> In addition, I recommend that we maintain the proviso suspending the $10,000 retirement cap for anyone enrolled in the police officer's retirement system. This will allow retired officers to re return to work and, and fill existing vacancies, and it will make our state safer. How about the revolving door? Ladies and gentlemen, our law enforcement officers know who the repeat criminals are. They know who they are. The repeat criminals commit over 80% of the crimes, and they know who they are. 16th Circuit Solicitor Kevin Brackett shared a shocking example of how, problem, how bad this problem is, and I present it to you now. On September 30, 2018, a repeat criminal, whose name I will not mention, who had a prior record of drugs, assault and battery, burglary, and illegal gun possession, was arrested and charged with possession of two stolen pistols, possession with intent to distribute crack and fentanyl, and to distribute it near a park or school, resisting arrest, and possession of a stolen M16A4 machine gun. As September 30th, 2018. He was released on a $10,000 bond. Less than four months later, he was charged with domestic violence of a high and aggravated nature. For what? For violently assaulted, assaulting his pregnant girlfriend. Once again, he was released on bond. Then a few weeks after that, this repeat criminal out on bond shot two people, killing one. The, the surviving gunshot victim was the same pregnant girlfriend he assaulted weeks earlier. He also held four people at guns, gunpoint assaulting three of them with a hammer. He fled and then shot a third victim later that same day, but she survived. Finally, after all that, he was arrested, convicted, and was eventually sentenced to life in prison. Unfortunately, ladies and gentlemen, this is happening every day. My question is, how long are we gonna let this keep happening? How long? What do we tell the families? What do we tell them? Law enforcement needs our help. They need stronger laws to keep illegal guns out of the hands of criminals and juveniles. They need new laws to close the revolving door and keep career criminals behind bars and not out on bond. That means we need no bond, no bond for recruit, repeat criminals. Those who commit a crime while out on bond should receive an automatic, mandatory five-year felony sentence with no early release or parole on top of the sentence for their previous crimes. Currently, there are no graduated criminal penalties for illegal gun possession in state law. That means the penalty is the same no matter how many times the criminal gets caught. This provides no deterrent. Graduated felony penalties with no bond will help keep repeat criminals behind bars and not out on bail where they can commit more crimes. But that's not all. We also need to stop shady bond, bail bond practices. Last October, I directed the Department of Insurance to crack down on these practices within the limited authority that it has. Today, I propose to you the establishment of minimum standards for court order GPS or electronic monitoring and the imposition of penalties on bondsmen who fail to maintain electric monitoring or fail to report violations of bond conditions to the court. Another point, 
we have today no means to carry out a death sentence in South Carolina. And nobody knows that better than the murderers and the killers. The families and loved ones of these murderers know it too. The Department of Corrections has been unable to carry out the death penalty by lethal injection, lethal injection since 2011 because the companies that make the drugs will not sell them unless their identities are shielded by state law from anti-death penalty activists. 14 states have enacted such a shield law. Director Brian Sterling and I've asked the General Assembly to address this for over for five years. In an effort to solve this problem, you will remember that we amended the death penalty law to make the electric chair the default method if a legal injection was unavailable and added the firing squad as a new means of execution. It was immediately challenged in court, scheduled executions were halted, and we now, once again, await a decision by our state Supreme Court, once again. Ladies and gentlemen, we cannot keep waiting. I ask this General Assembly, pass a shield law. We must give these grieving families and loved ones the justice and closure they are owed by law and tell the people of South Carolina that their government believes in the rule of law just like they do. We must also re-examine those issues, practices, and laws that make our state less competitive and make it difficult for families, businesses, and entrepreneurs to invest, grow, and thrive. One issue in need of re-examination is in the area of civil litigation known as joint and several liability. Nobody, including business owners, should be penalized for the actions of others simply because they have more money nor should anyone be absolved of responsibility for their own actions. I am confident that we can find a common sense formula which will provide accountability and just compensation without damaging our economy, and we must do it. In addition, I suggest that it's time for the members of the General Assembly who are attorneys to stop suing the bodies in which they serve, stop suing state agencies and plaintiff actions, and stop suing elected officials. This is absurd. It diminishes the public confidence not only in lawyer legislators, but in the rest of state government as well. We must also ensure that the public has confidence in whom and how our state's judges are selected by making the process more transparent and accountable. South Carolina is one of two states in which the General Assembly selects the members of the judiciary. It appears that the confidence in this arrangement is waning. Too often, the people's business is unattended. Justice delayed is justice denied. I suggest that our founding fathers prescribed a method for judicial selection that has served our federal government well and with which the public is quite familiar gubernatorial appointment of all judges with the advice and consent of the Senate requires no reinvention of the wheel, will inspire the confidence of our people, and will incur, encourage more excellent attorneys to seek public service. We should do that. <laughs> Last year, the U.S. Supreme Court ruling in Dobbs against Jackson, Women's Health Organization, gave us cause for confidence when it recognized that Roe against Wade was egregiously wrong, and quote, on the day it was decided, and that the U.S. Constitution does not prohibit states from regulating or prohibiting abortion. Unfortunately, the South Carolina Supreme Court delivered a temporary setback earlier this month. In a 3-2 decision, the court struck down the fetal heartbeat and protection from abortion act. Our court concluded that it violated a South Carolina constitutional provision that was proposed and adopted before Roe v. Wade at a time when nearly all abortions were illegal in South Carolina. I say respectively, respectfully, the court's decision is at odds with the law and the facts, and the lead opinion's results-oriented reasoning threatens to disrupt our constitutional separation of powers. When I signed the Heartbeat Act into law, 
I was confident that it was constitutional. I still am. Therefore, I will be filing a petition for rehearing next week along with other state officials, and I remain optimistic that we will prevail in our historic fight to protect and defend the right to and the sanctity of life. Finally, our shared cultural and natural heritage, abundant natural resources, and prosperous economy make us the envy of others and attractive to all, all over this country and the world. Explorers for kings and queens marveled at our mountains, beaches, sea islands, and marshes. They reported back to their sovereigns that the land was lush, fertile, and brimming with abundance. And I have no doubt if they were here now, they would have the same reaction and say the same thing. When the French, Spanish, and English settlers began arriving in South Carolina over 450 years ago, there were about two dozen groups of tribes or indigenous peoples, Indians, Native Americans, residing in the Low Country. The Ashpu, Bohicket, Cumbi, Edisto, Kiowa, Siwi, St. Helena, and Wando, among others, lived and thrived here, and their names live on today as majestic rivers, sea islands, towns, and other entities. Currently, a number of these tribes are officially recognized. The Catawba Indian Nation, the Beaver Creek Indians, the Edisto Natchez Cusso Tribe of South Carolina, the PD Indian Nation of Upper South Carolina, the PD Indian Tribe, the Piedmont American Indian Association, the Santee Indian Organization, the Sumter Tribe of Sheraw Indians, the Waccamaw Indian people, and the Waccamaw Tribe of Varnertown Indians. Many of these leaders of South Carolina's tribes are here with us today. Will you please stand and be recognized? By the time the English established the permanent settlement at Charlestown on the banks of the Ashley River in 1670, a global work network for trading and selling West Africans into slavery was well established by European nations, sending enslaved people to Brazil, the West Indies, and the American colonies. Between 1700 and 1775, 40% of the enslaved West Africans entering the colonies did so through Gadsden's Wharf in Charleston, which today is the location of the new International African American Museum. They came from the Windward Coast, the Ivory Coast, and the Gold Coast areas of West Africa, known today as Senegal, Sierra Leone, the Republic of Congo, and Ghana. This importation of enslaved persons was criminalized in the United States in 1808. Many descendants of these people are proudly represented today by the Gullah Geechee Nation, some living in South Carolina on the Sea Island properties owned by their ancestors. The Penn Center on St. Helena Island with its national landmark designation serves as the cultural capital and historic repository for the preservation of our Gullah heritage. Queen Quet Margarita L. Goodwine, chiefess of the Gullah Geechee Nation, is with us tonight. Ma'am, please stand and be recognized. It is believed that the first European Jewish settlers arrived in Charleston around 1700 from all over Europe to take advantage of the civil and religious liberty afforded in the colony of South Carolina. The congregation of Kahal Kadosh Beth Elohim has been the oldest synagogue in continuous use in North America 
and is known as the cornerstone of American Reform Judaism. By 1800, South Carolina had the largest Jewish population of any state in the United States. More battles and skirmishes were fought during the Revolutionary War in South Carolina than in any other state, over 200. The victory at Cowpens over the British Army turned the tide of the American Revolution and secured life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness for a new nation. And the term Sandlapper was born from a colloquial nickname bestowed upon South Carolinians by retreating, I repeat, retreating British, British troops. Efforts are now underway to preserve the stories and places of all these historic events and people that I mentioned and others. Clearly, South Carolina has an incomparable culture and natural heritage and distinguishes our state and people from others. We must honor, preserve, and be good stewards of that which we have been given. Economic growth and preservation of our shared heritage are not opposing objectives which must be balanced as a competition one against the other. Instead, they are complementary, intertwined, and inseparable, each dependent on the other. To strengthen one is to strengthen the other. The question today before us is, will anybody recognize South Carolina in 100 years from now? Will we allow our state's cultural culturally and environmentally significant places, structures, monuments, lands, islands, and waters to be lost, to overdevelopment, to mismanagement, to flooding, erosion, or storm damage? Or will we preserve and protect our history, our culture, and our environment, and the public's access to them before they are lost forever? This is our moment to act while we still can. To that end, I'm recommending that a total of $266 million be appropriated to the Conservation Land Bank, the Department of Natural Resources, and the Office of Resilience for the purpose of identifying and preserving culturally or environmentally significant properties and tracts in which the public access is in jeopardy of being lost forever. In closing, to the members of the General Assembly, I say let us continue our successful partnership, one that is based on communication, collaboration, cooperation, and trust. Let us embrace civility and comity through our thoughts, our actions, and our words, and urge our people, especially the young people, to be proud of their wonderful state. And let us set our state on a course that will provide these prop opportunities for prosperity, success, and happiness for generations of South Carolinians to come. Our sons, our daughters, and theirs as well. Ladies and gentlemen, the best is yet to come in South Carolina. May God continue to bless America and continue to bless the great state of South Carolina.